So, uh, bom dia. Uh, good morning, everyone. We will start now our third keynote talk, which are we are very much looking forward. It's a pleasure uh, to present Thomas Kuber. The, the title of his talk is Global Conservation Status of Palms, Where We Are and What We Need to Active. Uh, Thomas is a senior research at the French National Institute for Sustainable Development and is currently based as an invited research at the Pontificia Universidade Católica del Ecuador, in Quito, Ecuador. He received his PhD in tropical biodiversity from Wijnigen University in 2018 in the Netherlands and worked as a postdoc at the Osnabrück University in Germany and the New York Botanical Garden in the USA. His main, uh, main interest lies in understanding the evolution, resilience, and diversity of tropical biodiversity and rainforests in particular, one of the most complex and diverse ecosystems on the planet. He is chair of the UCN Species Survival Commission for Palms since 2018. And please, uh, the duration of this talk will be around 40 minutes and the last 20 minutes will be devoted to a question and answer quest session. You will be able to ask questions to Thomas during the talk using the Q&A box in the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. Please note that only questions asked in the Q&A box will be collected and directed to Thomas but feel free to make comments and interact in the chat box during the Q&A section. Toma, thank you so much. The word is with you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I just wanna thank the organizers of this uh, Palms 2021 conference. It hasn't been easy, but I think it's coming out really, really nicely now. Rita, Thais and Alexandra and all the supporting committee. Um, and also thank you for inviting me to this, to give a keynote on uh, a very broad subject, I would say. So um, I'm gonna try and cover a lot of ground today. Um, and um, please forgive me if I, if I don't talk about all the conservation status of all palms in the world. Um, I wanna start off by this quote, which I attribute to Lowen Gardiner, uh, that at least it's the first time I heard it, um, and so I attribute it to her. Uh, a species doesn't exist if it's not on the red list. Um, this is basically paraphrasing the idea that a species doesn't exist for the scientific community world if it doesn't have a name. And in this case, it means that if a species is not on the IUCN red list, it will not have any kind of impact in terms of conservation. Uh, a lot of companies, government agencies, and international agreements um, depend on species that are on the red list to um, uh, stir their, their conservation po policies. Uh, the presence of a species on a red list can have the power to overturn certain negative impacts on the environment. During this um, presentation, I would like to go over four main points. I'll first present an overview of palm conservation status, looking at the red list. Uh, we'll have a quick glimpse into the future uh, and what, what's in stake for palms. And then I'm gonna propose three ways forward in terms of palms conservation and present four objectives I, I would like us as a community to try and achieve by 2030. So the, in this first part, um, I went to the IUCN red list and downloaded all the um, assessed species on that list. Um, there are two versions of the IUCN criteria. The first one is a 2.8, which was um, in use up to 2001 um, and now is outdated. And from 2001 onwards, the IUCN published the version 3.1 of the different criteria species have to meet to be able to be on a red list. If I download all the data, we have about 750 species and 130 genera. Uh, obviously, um, uh, this doesn't include everything, but um, it's, it's, it's a fair amount. And if we only look at these more recent post-2001 um, ver uh, versions, we have just under 600 species that have been assessed, which is about 23% of palms are officially on the red list. So we still have some way to go to complete this. Looking into this data, and here I only looked into the data from uh, 2001 and afterwards, uh, we can see that about 50% of palms are officially threatened with extinction. These threats come into three main categories, going from vulnerable 
to endangered to critically endangered. And the critically endangered is the last step before we actually go to the extinct or extinct in the wild category. About 41% of species are not threatened, um, either in the near threatened or in the least concern um, categories. And to date, we only have one species which is officially on the IUCN list as extinct. And some of you might think this is obviously an underrepresentation. Looking at um, this threat per major realm, we have uh, going from Afrotropical, Oceania, Palearctic, et cetera, we can see that there's a huge bias towards conservation assessments undertaken in the Afrotropical region. This is a region which includes continental Africa as well as Madagascar. And the reason is because both of these regions have, or, or this realm in, 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 in general, has um, had very focused conservation assessments undertaken at the whole of the Madagascar uh, island and uh, also in um, continental Africa, and, and I'll discuss these results a bit more in detail later on. So this is the only palm that's on the red list using the latest version, which is declared as extinct, Roystonea stellata, uh, a species of palms which was collected in Cuba from the western, uh, from the eastern part of Cuba and Guantanamo province. Um, this, despite um, uh, searching activities and expeditions into the region, it has not been recollected for uh, uh, almost 80 years. And so this was declared um, in recently as, as being uh, extinct. If we go to the version 2.8, so these are species that have not been reassessed in the recent past. So, so prior, uh, um, this is prior to 2001. We also have Selaca lofospata from Borneo, which is only known by the type collection um, as I presented here. Um, it is no doubt that if this species was reassessed now, it would certainly fall into the extinct category, although maybe uh, an expedition to these areas would have been interesting to try and refine it. Another interesting category is the category extinct in the wild, uh, which for palms is, a, is, a, is an interesting category, uh, thanks to a lot of ex situ conservation of palms in botanic gardens, and I'm, I'm going to touch upon that later on in the talk. Karaifa taliera from uh, Myanmar in India was assessed in 1998 as extinct in the wild, but it's pretty common in botanic gardens and it's propagated by seeds. So this is, this is a special category um, in the IUCN where these species do not persist in the wild. Looking at different categories by different realms, we can see that we have 112 species officially on the red list, which are critically endangered. Here you have a snapshot of some of these. Again, a high bias towards the Afrotropical region, and this is mainly led by Madagascar. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that also a bit later on. Several genera have very high levels of, um, of uh, threat within their, within their, amongst their species. One of these is Hyophorbi, which is uh, uh, an interesting uh, genus with five species described. Four of these are critically endangered and one is vulnerable. So 100% of the genus is, is threatened. Uh, this, this genus is endemic to the mascarines. So an insular type habitat, and uh, we know that uh, in general biodiversity um, is highly threatened on island um, ecosystems. These assessments, however, are from 1998 and 2000, and we have two interesting cases. The first one is Heophorbi legionicolis, which is actually critically endangered, only known from uh, a small island off uh, Mauritius, round island, where a few individual, mature individuals persist, and so it's critically endangered in the wild but it's widely cultivated. And so this is the typical bottle, bottle palm that uh, you might have seen planted in, in different landscapes across the tropics. Another palm which is um, interesting is um, Heophorbi amaricolis, which, is, which was labeled the, the loneliest palm in the world, a bit paraphrasing the idea of Lonesome George, this giant turtle on the Galapagos Island, which was the last individual of its species. And so like Lonesome George, this specimen here in the Botanic Garden of Curipepe on Mauritius has been fenced out, a scaffold erected around it to really protect it and safeguard it for conservation in the future. And uh, propagation, seed propagation, at least until what I've seen up to now is not being really successful with seedlings dying uh, pretty fast. And so uh, conservation actions are still pretty much uh, focused to try and propagate this, this species uh, based on this its single individual. In terms of uh, endangered, we have about the same amount as critically endangered species with 110. Uh, again, a, a bias towards Afrotropical um, specimens linked to, to Madagascar. 
Uh, again, a snapshot here of different um, endangered species around, around the world. Vulnerable, we have 77 species, uh, again, a bias towards Afrotropical from the Madagascar area, and another interesting snapshot of different uh, palms which have been assessed as vulnerable across the world. So I've been talking about Afrotropical a lot, and that's the reason is because it's been uh, it's the only continent, including Madagascar, that has, has undertaken assessments of all palm species at the continental level. Uh, and this is interesting because we can do some nice comparisons. So the first study by Rakatonoraiv uh, and colleagues in 2014 um, found that over 83% of palms on Madagascar were threatened. And you can see this here, 33% uh, of palms are critically, in, species of palms in Madagascar are critically endangered, uh, which, which is a huge amount. And again, characteristic of this uh, island type um, habitat and huge population, uh, human pressure on, on vegetation and deforestation. In contrast, continental Africa, which I underline has significantly less species, 66 species, um, is mainly composed of species which are not threatened. So 64%, 65% are these concerned. And only 10% of species on continental Africa are threatened and only one species is critically endangered, uh, Eremos fata berendii from Cameroon. Um, this is interesting. Another important point is that we have a lot of species which are data deficient still, and this mainly comes from, from raffia, uh, from the genus raffia, which, which we're currently revising um, uh, by Su Suzanne Moguet and collaborators in, in Cameroon. Um, and so it's interesting to see these different comparisons and how uh, these different settings lead to different conservation assessments. Um, the, the reason for these is can, can be multiple. Uh, one observation is that African palms are obviously more widespread than Malagasy ones. So here we have a bar plot of distributions um, in function of the um, area, of extent, uh, area of occurrence, no, extent of occurrence um, here in, um, in square kilometers. And we can see in blue, the Malagasy uh, palms have very narrow distributions a lot of narrow endemics and, and Madagascar uh, African palms have many wide distributions here. So this is the reason why we have uh, under the criterion B, we have these different um, assessments and these different threats. Uh, another point is that in, in Africa, we might be um, subject to cryptic species. Uh, several studies led by Olivier uh, Hardy in Brussels have shown that wide widespread tree species uh, can generally be broken up into uh, smaller species based on morphology and genetic uh, genetic data. So maybe some of these widespread palms are in fact several smaller species. Another point could be the difference in biogeographic history between Madagascar and Africa, with an increase in aridification in continental Africa potentially impacting or ex um, <clears throat> um, leading to extinction of narrow uh, na uh, uh, several narrow endemics in that in that region. An interesting point for, from, our, from our research on the conservation status of African palms was that um, we also have a much better knowledge of them, uh, in particular based on, on fieldwork, a lot of uh, fieldwork undertaken in Central and, and Western Africa over the times, but also in other more drier areas such as um, Egypt and Sudan. And so one of the most uh, drastic examples of this is the Medemia argum, which uh, initially was uh, thought to be extinct um, then was reevaluated as critically endangered. And in the latest revision that we've done uh, of this um, species, it's now vulnerable. Um, uh, and this is really interesting. It was uh, led by numerous researchers in Sudan uh, and Egypt, um, and they went into the field to, to really relocate the specimen. And what's interesting, and, and Wolf was hinting toward this in his closing remarks of the Q&A, first Q&A session, is that these palms can readily be identified or seen from, from, from space. And so, um, using satellite images, uh, these Medemia grows in, in desertic areas, as you can see in this picture. Um, there are very few other palms, uh, Phoenix dactylifera, which has a very different crown type from, from above. And so you can actually count the number of individuals. And so this is what was done within this, within this project and led to the reassessment of vulnerable, although this species is threatened by mining and other uh, anthropic activities. Another interesting case is Raffia regalis, um, raffia is well known because it has the largest leaf, the longest leaf in the, in the plant world. You can see here a picture of three people trying to hold up that massive leaf, which goes all the way up almost to the canopy. Um, this palm was little known before, mainly because it was not really collected uh, because of its leaf size. 
Um, but um, field work in that region by, by colleagues, uh, previous colleagues uh, and myself and, and, and collaborators from different countries have recollected this, this specimen of the species numerous times. It's actually, in some cases, it can be dominant in the understory, forming a forest under the forest. It's a really interesting site. So this has been reevaluated as least concern from, from a vulnerable status. And if you want to know more about uh, raffia and its uses, uh, I refer you to the talk of Suzanne Moguet, talk um, 2953. It'll be really hard for me to talk about conservation of palms without um, providing some success stories. Obviously, I can't list them all here. There are many numerous success stories. And it's even harder for me to talk about conservation of palms without mentioning Tahina spectabilis. Um, uh, I, I would refer you to uh, really exciting articles that were published in Palms. Um, by, by Lauren, um, and also a talk, and if you scan this while I, while I present, you can, you can be directed to the talk of John Dransfield. Um, he gave a webinar um, on Tahina spectabilis, and it's really a fascinating account about how this genus was discovered and its conservation. And so this is a conservation success because ever since it was described in 2008, uh, numerous conservation actions have been done, especially by local people fencing off populations, um, and uh, there's also been a rediscovery of, uh, or, or does a, re a discovery of a new population. So it was only known from a single locality. And in 2017, Lauren and, and colleagues would uh, describe this new population. And so this is a case where the, 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 the species, although critically endangered, it, its distribution is increasing over the years. Another really interesting case is this more recently described palm, Sabal antinesis from uh, Curaçao. Um, uh, project led by uh, Patrick Griffins, and I, 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 I encourage everybody to go and see the talk about this, about different activities in the region of conservation, uh, talk 3042. Um, and this is also suggested by Patrick as being an ex excellent example of conservation of palms on, on, on small island ecosystems. And again, Sabal Antinensis has, has been increasing its distribution over, over the decades and an increase in mature individuals. So these are two examples of really interesting uh, success stories. And as I said, there, there are probably many more, uh, and some of you maybe in this audience have, have experienced this. And I'll be interested to discuss your success stories um, later on in, in, this, in this conference. So now I just wanted to have a quick look forward. And so th this is really my personal view on, on palms, I would say, and, and I, I might be missing many things. Uh, but for me, it seems like there's going to be a mixed outlook um, in let's say by the end of this century. Um, first, and I'm going to give the positive sides. First, we have a vibrant community, and this conference is, is, is really uh, showing this. We have people from all around the world, um, talks on all kinds of different aspects of palms. Uh, uh, we, we, we've known, a lot of us know, know each other for a long time. We're also very lucky to have this very important um, uh, institution, which is the International Palm Society, sorry, which is the International Palm Society. Uh, which brings together not just palm scientists, but also palm growers, palm lovers. Um, and uh, this is really an incredible tool uh, that not many other um, plant families might have, and in, in, in particular in the tropics. And if you look at John Dransfield's talk about Tahina, you'll see that the International Palm Society, um, via its Palm Talk platform, really played a fundamental role in, in, in providing the description of one of these most incredible palms um, to date. Obviously, we have a number of symposium like this one, the palms, the UNOPS in Europe, and we also have the IUCN Species Survival Commission, which is focused on palms. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. Palms are charismatic. I don't need to enforce this, but the point is that we can make the headlines pretty easily with palms. And I, I would think that if um, one day um, somebody decided to destroy all the Tahina populations, it would create a, an incredible international outrage. And so this is really positive for conservation when you can get the attention of the general public. Um, and this is not given to all plant families, maybe orchids or cycads, but other plant families is much harder to get such an attention uh, based on, on a number of, of research that we do or, or conservation actions. Again, uh, we have an incredibly good knowledge of the biology with the big B, taxonomy, evolution, ecology, uh, um, ethnobotany. Uh, we, we know a lot about palms and, and being palms being a tropical family, this is actually an incredible um, advantage. And Wolf also hinted towards this and, and Taisi too in, in, her, in, their, in their concluding remarks. So um, this is, this is a, also a huge advantage in terms of conservation for the future. And finally, palms are also have an incredible 
ex situ collections in botanic gardens. Um, and I'm going to talk about that more in detail later on. So this is also a huge strength for conservation. On the negative side, if we look into the future, um, we know that in the future, tropical rainforests and, and other types of ecosystems that we've been talking about, but tropical rainforests in particular, where palms are particularly diverse, um, palms do, I, I, tropical rainforests are going to be fragmented in, in the future. And, and we've seen this in numerous occasions. As time goes by, rainforests will be more and more fragmented. And unfortunately, palms don't seem to do very well in fragmented sites. And I'm going to refer, to, refer you to this really interesting talk by Maria Beshimol on looking at abundance and richness of palms in the Atlantic Brazil, uh, Brazilian Atlantic forest um, in function of, the, uh, of fragmentation. And just you can see here, as fragmentation occurs or forest cover di diminishes, so does overall richness and overall abundance, which is, which is pretty worrying. Here's an example of um, Quindio in Colombia. For those who went to the Palms 2015 field trip, you would recognize. And so this is a typical situation of fragmentation where we have pastures for, for cow browsing, milk and, and meat production. And then we have these isolated forests, which in this case harbor huge populations of the tallest palm in the world, Ceroxylon quinduense. Um, Ceroxylon quinduense is a charismatic palm. It's the tallest palm in the world. We were all very impressed when we saw this. Um, and, and it's also the national tree of Colombia. And um, talks by uh, Rodrigo Bernal um, uh, from Colombia, who's been really active in trying to conserve these, this area in particular, has mainly remained unsuccessful, uh, which, is, which is pretty worrying because if, if uh, in terms of protection, uh, even though he, he, he interacts a lot and, and a lot of people in these regions are really uh, major, act, uh, major act, um, actors in conservation of this palm, the government still doesn't agree to uh, provide a, 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 a reserve or a protected area around these areas. Um, and so this is pretty worrying that it's such a charismatic palm, and even then it's hard to get some kind of attention. What happens in these regions, and this is a syndrome that happens throughout all of the tropics, um, is what I call the dead palm standing syndrome, where basically forests are cleared and then palms in general are left standing. Uh, maybe because they're hard to chop down, they have very strong wood, or because they, the, the, the agricultures might think that they have some kind of usefulness um, in terms of, 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 of the products that they can provide. And so these palms are dead because basically they're going to grow, they're going to die, and they're not going to be able to give any kind of generation uh, because the cows um, eat uh, all the little seedlings. So this is a worrying syndrome throughout all of the tropics. A similar area is Western Ecuador, um, so the coastal part of Ecuador leading up to the Pacific area. Uh, where we also have a situation of highly fragmented rainforest. And, and this picture I'm showing you was taken last week from a field trip I did to this region. And this is actually a very good case where we have a lot of forest and some pasture, but mainly we only have pasture. Um, and so we can see this uh, frontier between humans and, and nature. And, and what's interesting with these forests is that they're really mature forests. I mean, I visited many of them. Uh, what happens is that uh, this is an area where deforestation is pretty recent, has been ongoing maybe for the last 50, 60 years recent might be relative in this case. And um, the government would have incisives for people to go there and, 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 and plant and do agriculture for the, for the economy of the place. So the, the lands were pretty cheap a long time ago and people would buy huge amounts and they would deforest until they thought, well, well we don't need to deforest anymore. We have enough cows and, and we're doing well. And then they would just leave these forests there standing intact. And so uh, these forests contain a huge amount of interesting species. Um, for example, uh, here we have Atalia colenda, which was also on my first slide. We have Iriartea deltoide, we have Astrocarium standelianum, and we also have a bunch of understory palms in the genera Geonoma, uh, Camedoria, and Bactris. Um, so this is a really diverse um, ecosystem. And we also have this dead, dead palm standing syndrome. Here we have Atalia colenda, which are massive palms, um, really thick stems, these are giants of the forest in there. Uh, if a leaf falls on, on the back of a cow, it will kill it in, in, instantaneously. Um, and we can see again that these palms are just less standing um, to their, and without any kind of opportunity for regeneration. Another typical scenario is this one. So instead of having pasture, we have plantations for banana. And palms are also left standing in these types of situations. Here we have Fita de Fas Equatorialis, or the Tagua which is um, a very useful palm. It was used, the seeds are very hard and white, the vegetable ivory, and they've been used to do buttons in the past and now more to do handicrafts. And the, and the leaves are also used for thatching. 
And if you want to know more about this species, it's evolutionary history and past uh, evolution in this region. It's an endemic to, to, to Ecuador. Um, uh, I would refer you to the, the talk of uh, Sebastian Escobar, 2887. Looking into the future again, well, um, the other point is that the current status is pretty worrying and it's exceptionally worrying in island situations, as I said before. Madagascar, 83%, the West Indies, although this is a study that's um, almost 14 years old, 38% of species. Um, in other situations, I talked about Hyophobi and the mascarines. Um, Hawaii, for example, has 23 species, um, not, not updated on taxonomy here, but about 23 species, and most of those are uh, threatened with extinction. Um, talking about the West Indies, if you want to learn more about the evolution of this area, which is really fascinating and, and obviously can be linked to the conservation of these species, I would refer to the talk by Angela Cano, um, talk 2872. Um, what we can do now too is use the distribution of palms to try and model the, 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 the distribution, uh, uh, the future distribution of palms. And so this has been undertaken at continental levels in two cases in Africa by Anne Black Overgaard um, and, in, um, and in the Neotropics uh, more recently by Velasco and colleagues. And um, both of these studies are not very encouraging. They show there's going to be important loss of suitable habitat for palms in the future in these regions. And more worryingly, worryingly um, protected areas, which is one of the most effective tools that we have against uh, for conservation and against extinction, might be largely ineffective to conserve certain aspects of biodiversity, such as phylogenetic diversity, and that was shown by Velasco and, and colleagues. Um, there's also been several studies on individual species and how these individual species will be uh, will bode in the future. We've seen a few of those examples in, in Roseanne's talk, um, the keynote, the first keynote. And I would refer you to a very interesting study by Carolina Silva on Butia Yatai um, in, in southern Brazil and, and, and Argentina, and how this species is also not going to do very well in future climate change um, scenarios. So I want to tackle this point about the three ways forward that we as a group can, can try and adopt to, um, for palm conservation. Obviously, this is my personal view. Um, I think we've seen very uh, interesting talks at this conference about different aspects of palm biology in general that, that could uh, be really important for, for palm conservation. Um, here I'm just going to present these three points. The first one is that we really need to speed up conservation assessments. We really need to get all these species onto the red list for all the reasons that I, that I suggested before. Um, th this is really within our reach, especially within our community. What's interesting is that numerous programs have been published over the years, and especially in 2017, apparently, um, uh, are programs which allow us to accelerate um, uh, preliminary assessments. Now, these don't do the assessments because we really need to have a human eye on conservation assessments to be able to come to a final conclusion, but it does um, streamline and speed up the estimates of um, different parameters that you need to undertake, you need to, to have when you do these assessments. And, um, you can also fuse in different types of layers of uh, human um, use layers, um, deforestation layers. And now that we have access to all these um, herbarium databases where they've databased in georeference specimens, and, and some of this is also available on GBIF, it's really a unique opportunity to actually speed this up. As an example, I, I, I used the data set that was kindly provided by Sidonie Bello, uh, Xi Jing Lu, and, and Bill Baker, where they curated a, a data set of about 77,000 herbarium records, which are georeferenced, representing 1,800 palm species around the world. And I ran this through this program that, 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 that we, we generated in our lab called CONAR. And CONAR allows you in a very basic way to preliminary assess species using criteria B. So that means using AOO, EOO, number of locations, and if a specimen is in or outside a protected area. And when I did this very preliminary analysis, um, we had uh, about 65% of species are potentially threatened with extinction based on our data set. 30% endangered, 20% critically endangered, um, and about 35% which are not endangered. So this, this is actually worrying, but it's really preliminary. We can also project these um, uh, uh, spatially, and here I'm projecting uh, presenting the proportion of threatened palm species. So we take the total number of palm species and we calculate the proportion of how many of those palm species are threatened. And what you can clearly see is, again, islands having a critical level of threat. Um, here, um, the Caribbean islands, 
Um, most of Southeast Asia has a high proportion of threatened species and obviously Madagascar. Um, other regions uh, along the Pacific coast of Colombia and Ecuador also seem to have some kind of, it's not really clear, but it's uh, also seem to have a high proportion of threatened species. Whereas the Amazon basin um, and, and the Atlantic coast of, of Brazil too has, uh, has a signal of increased threat. Uh, other regions such as the Amazon basin might have a lower proportion. So we're not saying there are no threatened species, we're saying that the proportion compared to the device the, um, diversity is lower. In Africa, we have several of these points, which are, which are, representative of almost 100%, but that's mainly because there are fewer species in these regions. And here, for example, we can see areas where Medemia agrum was, was collected in, in the past. So uh, in, this, in this aspect, we have a really fascinating new outlook, which is machine learning. Machine learning is basically uh, a part of art, uh, artificial intelligence. And machine learning allows to train your data set to try and identify certain situations um, automatically. And so this is a really interesting poster by Sidonie Bello and collaborators, poster 3044, um, where they took, undertook this. So they used the, obviously the same data set that they shared with me. And they undertook a machine learning analysis where basically you provide it with different, um, different parameters and you train your data set to recognize situations of threat or not. And so when they ran this through the data set, we can see here in this, um, in this uh, column, uh, the number of threatened species under different scenarios, worst case scenario, best case scenario. And this kind of, although it's a less than, than what I found was CONAR, it's about 10, uh, 1000 species which are potentially threatened. And so this is a really interesting avenue which could be, um, uh, which has been applied to palms and which is going to be really interesting to identify what palms we need to focus conservation assessments on. The other point I wanted to discuss was the increase, uh, increase the importance of genetic data. Um, this, this is interesting because genetic data is going to provide us with a lot of information um, about how conservation is, is ongoing, but also on um, the diversity. So we know the genetic diversity is, is, is a really a fundamentally important aspect of, of species biology in order to adapt uh, to future climate change. If, if, if they can't move, they're going to need to adapt. So higher genetic diversity can be linked to higher probabilities of survival. Here, um, going back to Tahina Spectabilis is a really interesting um, uh, article that was published by Alison Shapcott and colleagues. Um, so th this here, this, this population here is uh, the original population where Tahina was, was identified. And uh, uh, Alison Shapcott and, coll and colleagues went there um, dur during the 2000s and, and collected all and sampled all the individuals of Tahina and did a genetic data study and in, in, in this preliminary study, they suggested that there should be other populations. So just based on the genetic data, they could see a signal of, of uh, new populations or other populations in the region. And lo and behold, after an expedition led by Lauren Gardinier and Alison Shatcott and colleagues from Madagascar, they did find this new Tahina population, uh, which was a bit here, uh, about 40 kilometers more to the north. Um, and so in this paper, they sampled all individuals of all these populations and they provide fundamental ideas that Tahina is not very, has a low genetic diversity, which is a bit worrying, although some populations do show high levels of genetic diversity. And again, this is an indication that po possibly there aren't other populations that have yet to be described. And so this is, as I said, really, really positive. Another case is going back to Hyophorbi legenicolis, which um, actually, as I said, is only known in the wild and from a small island of Mauritius, round island, where um, surveys have only found three mature individuals left, which you can see a picture here. Um, a, a program of reintroduction has been undertaken where we have small seedlings, so a seedling cohort. And the genetic studies of, this, of these two populations show that this new generation is a bit more diverse or is more genetically diverse than the older generation. And so this means that the reintroductions are working and um, that that's positive. Um, they also compared the genetic diversity of these wild individuals to the cultivated um, ex situ collections, I would say that we have. Um, and they showed that the genetic diversity of the wild is similar to the one of the cultivated. And so that's really positive um, in terms of, of conservation. That means that what we have outside of its wild area can be used to um, re, uh, reintroduce into these areas and regenerate, I would say, this, this populations in terms of genetic diversity. A final example that I want to present is the one uh, that's been uh, undertaken by Andrew Helmstetter. Uh, in Q. And um, the point here was that the question that they wanted to address is a really interesting one for conservation. It's have rare species always been rare or are they rare linked to human actions? 
Um, and this goes to the inherent side of the biology of these species. If a species has always been rare, and or you could imagine that maybe, maybe biologically it will be able to survive, but if it's become rare because of human actions, then it's not, not, such, not, not, not such good news. And so in their study, which was focused in Madagascar as an ideal model, they looked at four palm species and they only have the, and what's interesting is that they were able to use genome data by sampling a few individuals only because rare species are only known by a few individuals. Um, and what they've shown is that this using, uh, inferring the population uh, demographics in time, which we can do using genetic data, they've shown that these species actually have declined recently in their, in their level of effective population sizes, which supports the idea that these species were not always rare. And so we can use this to predict extinction and, and very rare species. And another avenue is trying to apply this to herbarium material, which is also really interesting. The last avenue that I think um, is really interesting and something that I'm, I'm not really aware of, I, I do not belong to a botanic garden and um, my interactions with botanic gardens is mainly via the herbarium. And um, although I, I admire the ex situ collections, I don't know them. I was fortunate enough to um, have uh, access to a, a database which was provided by BGCI, uh, which kind of gave an update of all individuals in botanic gardens across the world. And I was really amazed to see that over 500 botanic gardens around the world in the tropics and outside of the tropics across 90 countries hold at least one specimen or one individual of palms. XC2 collections represent about 1,900 species uh, this is not has not been taxonomically verified, I'm sorry, um, but that's kind of what, what we're looking at, representing 1, 000, uh, 15,200 individuals of palms. Uh, in, in a previous study 20 years ago, um, Morander and colleagues looked at botanic garden ex situ collections and found that about 33% of species in these collections belong to threatened species as listed on the IUCN. Uh, this would need to be reevaluated now um, but it's really interesting to see that a quarter of our endangered species might be held ex situ. The big winner, and I'm a bit ashamed to say I didn't know about this botanic garden, is Nong Nok Tropical Botanic Garden in Thailand. 815 individuals representing 450 species, which is uh, pretty amazing. And I hope one day I can go and visit that botanic garden. Here is a, a bar plot of um, the, the number, so it's number of species, it should be number of specimens, sorry, here. Um, and we can see the most uh, important botanic gardens, the top 15 botanic gardens, um, starting with um, non knock and finishing with, with um, uh, Q. And um, so this re really represents an important aspect of palm conservation for the future. Botanic gardens can also be used um, to describe species. And so we have this situation where species were first described in cultivation and then rediscovered in, um, in the wild. And, and one example, is Dipsis robusta, which is this really large Dipsis with huge inflorescences, which was first described from cultivation uh, in 2005, and then rediscovered or, or discovered, or rediscovered would be the word, um, in, 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 um, in the wild a few years later. Um, and here you can see one of these wild uh, individuals. And so in palms, at least of Madagascar, we have this situation which occurred several times where species were first described in cultivation and then in, um, in, in the rediscovered in the wild. Some of these have not been rediscovered in the wild for, for, for the moment. Uh, a final point is um, genetic diversity in ex situ collections. And here I'm gonna refer, refer you to the talk by Patrick Griffin, really inspiring talks, really, per, really important questions for conservation given that palms are widely available ex situ. How do botanic gardens conserve genetic diversity? So this kind of links up these two last points. Um, and I'm not going to go really into detail about this, but the main point here is that botanic gardens are really important, uh, but maybe not by themselves. And so to get a huge amount or a good amount of genetic diversity, we need to pull efforts between botanic gardens. And Patrick give, makes the point that this really needs to be an important effort in the future. And I, and I echo that, that conclusion. I'm going to finish off by uh, a few more points, um, uh, which is the Palm Specialist Group. And so Maybe many of you don't know this. There, there's a special um, group within the IUCN, which is called the Species Survival Commission, SSC. And we're really lucky as a palm community to have an SSC focusing on palms. Several other plant families have it, ferns, cycads, um, orchids, obviously. Uh, but in, in all this, not that many. And so palms are, are lucky to have this. So um, the objective here is to conserve palms by assessing the threats and to try and develop programs to protect palms. 
We've been more active as a group, uh, which has been in existence for, uh, I guess, 20 years already. Have to check that. Um, and it was first chaired by, by, by Bill Baker and then by myself. And we've been much more active in terms of assessing threats and, and getting species onto the red list than actually developing programs to protect palms. Um, this species specialist group works in, um, in cycles of four years. We're at the end of a cycle now when we're going to start a new cycle in 2021 to 2024. Um, there's a chair, which is myself. I was in this in the last cycle, and I'm, I'm going to continue. I'll be happy to. Um, there's also a red list coordinator who helps exactly um, get species onto the red list. Now, this is a, a job that's hard to keep. It was first um, uh, led by Lauren Gardiner, who did an excellent job, and then by Ariane Cousio. Uh, but both of them have renounced, and now um, I really need to find somebody. So if anybody's out there um, and wanting to have this experience, I'd be really glad to discuss that. The, uh, the, the Palm Specialist Group is basically a community of palm experts. For the moment, we're about 40. There's a huge bias towards experts in taxonomy and evolution and in ecology, which is, which is really great because that's a really important theoretical foundation of this group. But we are lacking experts in more hands-on applied uh, palm conservation. And I've seen several, several talks here which kind of allude to that, like more in the field, how we can protect palms. Um, and so I'm, I'm having a shout out for anybody who has that type of expertise. Uh, it can be in palms or, uh, or palms as a main focus or just palms as one of their interests. Um, I would be really lovely to discuss um, your, 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 your help in this community. And another, another part that we're missing are experts um, from botanic gardens who take care of live collections. So as I said, we have a lot of people in there who belong to botanic gardens, but they apparently belong more to the uh, herbarium side. And so we really, Fascinating to have people who are actually curating palms, living palms in these botanic gardens as part of our efforts. We can have funding opportunities. We are not a funding body. So I get emails about people asking for funding. I do not have any budget. We do not manage a budget, but we do have opportunities for funding via the IUCN. And these fundings are only done if the funding that we're searching for have been inscribed as targets or actions within our community. And so this is an important part is to define targets what do we want to do? So we have targets, for example, red listing palms of Borneo, red listing palms of Western Africa, or different actions, looking at the ecology of endangered species, etc. So these are all listed as actions and targets on our website. An example of, of a very interesting grant that we'll be able to get because of the specialist group via a, an internal grant, that means it's only applicable to people belonging to the um, SSE groups, is this um, EDGE group. So EDGE is for the um, uh, endangered species which are on long phylogenetic branches. Um, and this was provided, this was given to Monica Morales from, from, from Bolivia with the help of Julie Saroncal. And actually they had the, from what I've seen, they were classified first of the whole group. And so there were about five grants of $10,000 that were given out. And this grant is mainly focused on Parajubea species in Bolivia, where we have a number of uh, few species, but these are, again are highly threatened. We have the Jubea cocoides, which is largely planted around um, Andean cities. But then there are two other species, uh, Parajubia shunka, which is critically endangered, and Parajubia tohali, which has also not been assessed. And that was one of the reasons why this grant was given to them. And so they're already producing, they already did field work and producing some interesting posters for its conservation. So uh, I invite you to see the talk by Monica Moraes on uh, conservation and usage of um, Bolivian palms. So this is the last part of my talk. Sorry, I'm, I'm maybe I'm, I'm over uh, extending a bit here, but there's a lot to say. And um, I would like to set a few goals as a community. And I invite anybody who's interested in participating in these goals. Obviously, I won't be able to reach them by myself. Uh, so I, I'm looking for help in, in any kind of way. The first objective, which is really at our reach, is to get all palms red listed. This is something that the IUCN has approached our group um, to try and get. There, there, there's something called the, the, the red list index, which actually allows you to do the red listing um, over several several times and then see how these, these red listing um, uh, assessments change over time. And they wanted palms to be part of that. So this is an objective I think we should be able to reach at least by 2030. Uh, another point is to gather more genetic data around critically endangered species. I don't think that's, that, that's obviously not something that we'll be able to fund. Uh, Roseanne was talking about funding problems in her keynote too. Um, uh, but, you know, it would be interesting, for example, to have a database pooling all of uh, critically endangered species genetic assessments and then potentially trying to provide some kind of article um, looking at 
how palms um, uh, do when, when they're critically endangered. Um, this point was um, stressed by Patrick in his talks, improve interactions by botanic gardens. Um, I'm not a botanic garden person, I'm sorry, I don't know all the intricate details of botanic gardens and how they collaborate. Um, so I'm just saying this as, as a general comment. Um, I think we really need to interact more if, if, that's, if that's already not the case. Um, and this is something I'll be really happy to talk about and see how we can move forward. The final suggestion I have as, as a community would be to try and provide a new Palm Conservation Action Plan by 2026. The last one was published by Johnson and collaborators in 1990, um, 2026, sorry. So this one was published in 1996. Um, so that's almost 25 years ago. And it provided an outline of general knowledge about palm conservation across the world and several actions that we need to take. And so it'll be really interesting to try and use this uh, and provide a new one uh, within the IUCN um, uh, uh, palm group that, that we have. And I would suggest 2026, which might coincide with the next palm meeting and which will also be 30 years after the first one. A really uh, uh, regional example of this is this um, strategy for conservation and sustainable use of palms in Madagascar, which was led by uh, Mijuru Rakonaraif and um, uh, with the help of, uh, of myself, Bill Baker and other people who, who were part uh, my, my role in this was mainly just because of the, the IUCN uh, chair, but it was a really fascinating document. It's available in English and in French freely uh, as a PDF. And it provides an overview of palm conservation in Madagascar with a number of actions for the future. And so if anybody's interested in trying to have such a document for their country or their region of interest, please, um, I would be happy to, to help and to share um, uh, my experience and also to lie through with different people who have done this in, in, the, in the past. So with this, I just want to conclude. I want to thank Sidonie for sharing the data on the palm distribution. Um, I also have two recommendations. First, subscribe to the International Palm Society. I already said it's an incredible tool. Um, it's also an incredible tool for, uh, for, for communicating. Um, we're really lucky to have it. It also provides a lot of funding for fieldwork. And a lot of what I presented today comes directly from palm um, exploration, which has been funded by the society. So it's very important to help. My personal opinion was it's funded many of my very first field trips, which has led to uh, being able to get more larger grants. And so we really need to, 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 to support the society by subscribing. It's not that expensive. I mean, it's about 150 for three years, I would suggest um, uh, subscribing for three years, so it's done. And the other point is publish, publish, publish in Palms. A lot of what I've been presenting today doesn't come from nature, science, or PNES, it comes from Palms. Because in Palms, you can publish these types of data, you can publish observations, um, things that might be more tricky to get into other journals. Um, we have photos, we have documentations, we have all kinds of aspects of Palms. So please, as a community, we really need to publish. And, and John was uh, who's an editor with Scott Zona, John Dransfield, uh, was saying that they're having a bit of trouble getting um, articles in. So I know it's a bit of a hassle uh, to write up um, articles, but if any of you have some interesting palm related um, data, please uh, don't hesitate to palm, uh, to, to, palm to, <laughs> to publish in palms. Uh, thank you. Um, I suggest that we meet in the lounge uh, for anybody who's um, up to discussing anything I said. I'll be there for the next for the next hour. Uh, again, thank you for the community to, to the to the organizing committee for inviting me, and um, I hope to see everybody soon um, in live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, very much for your exciting talk, and uh, I think it, uh, we are in a perfect audience to ask for assess the conservation status of palms by the next uh, Palm meeting or 2030, <laughs> we, can, we can try to do this. Uh, so we have some questions here in the Q&A uh, Q box for you. I will ask you the first one that's from Caroline Draxler. Hi, Thomas, thanks for the amazing talk. I'd like to ask whether risk uh, assessment of palms also take into account loss of dispersers as a main treat for some palm species. And also, uh, how can we integrate data on local extinction of palm species into risk assessment, mostly uh, for those that have a wide distribution range and are locally threatened, for example, by forest loss? Okay, thank you, Caroline, for that interesting question. Yes, obviously, I've, I've been following a lot of the work on the uh, impact of 
of seed dispersals um, in palms, uh, very fascinating work. And it's something I was hoping to be able to put into one of these uh, future uh, directions, but unfortunately time didn't allow me to. And I'm glad you asked the question. Um, from, from, from my point of view, um, the inclusion of dispersers is not um, in there yet. Um, the idea of the assessments is to really see um, if there's going to be a decrease in population size over, over, the, over the time. So, uh, for example, under the different criteria, um, depending on how much data you have, in general, we use the criteria B, and that's really based on the, on the um, geographic distribution, uh, documented geographic distribution of, of species. Um, and if they're in or out protected areas and how areas that are protected, how well they're protected. Um, so all these types of analysis. Um, I think that um, on, on, on the longer view, it will be very interesting because obviously, as, as I've seen in these presentations, dispersers are going to be fundamental for the future of these species. Um, uh, and, and especially in these fragmented environments that we've seen where uh, these dispersers are basically just stuck in these forests and it's very hard for them to cross them. We've seen a, a few talks about that. Um, on the data about local extinction, there, there are two types of, um, of uh, uh, assessments. You have the global assessment where you take the whole uh, distribution of a species uh, into account, and you have regional assessments or country assessments too. Um, one, of the, one of these examples is Boracius Ethiopium. We, we heard about that in, in uh, a talk on that. And um, in certain countries, um, Boracius Ethiopium, which is, which is a widespread African palm, a savanna palm, uh, so it's, it's very widespread and it occurs in East, West Africa, but locally, as you're mentioning, it's, it's, it might be, it is threatened because of overexploitation. So the, the, these are also taken into account. So you can take into account locally, local threats um, into a country or into a regional assessment in, in contrast to a global one for these widespread species. Thank you, Thomas. I think I would jump the, the queue and ask a question myself, if you don't mind. And uh, so, so I, I know that we are still struggling to red list palms based on criteria B, that is uh, extension of occurrence and area of occurrence. And that, but how do you think the scenario will change if we move to, to criteria A or on populational trends and or um, uh, to to the number of um, of adults in populations in terms of uh, red listing pounds because one 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 concern I, I have two concerns with this one is that climate is changing and population trends may be may be different in the future and another that for many places uh, where palms are hyper diverse they they could also be rare. And, uh, and even having just very large area of occurrence. So, so they, they, may, they may have like small populations and, and we are not able to, to look from this perspective, just from, from criteria B. I would like to, to hear our views on that. So it's, it's too, too early to think about. No, no, very, very, <laughs> very, very good question. I think one of the main strengths of the IUCN and that's why it's recognized as an authoritative um, list, is it's um, different sets of criteria that you can actually use to assess. And so um, when we talk about IUCN red listing, it's not just for plants, it's also for animals. So you kind of need to find a methodology which fits everybody. And to do that, they designed a certain number of criteria which goes from, from uh, A to, to E. Um, and under these different criteria, um, it really depends on the data that you have. So if you have a situation where you have been following populations of palms uh, for several generations or for several years, well, then you can go rather to the to the to the A or the C um, criteria. The the B one is mainly used in plants because that's really the only data that we have. Uh, we have herbarium specimens, and that's the only record we might have of the population. Um, so, obviously, um, to answer your question, it's there is uh, already a situation already criteria which allow you to take these into account, and it depends on your data um, for these rare species. Um, that, that, are, that have a wide distribution, but which are really locally um, uh, rare, um, uh, then, then that really depends on the data that you have. If, if you've been into the field and you've documented the whole population, you've counted all the number of individuals uh, 10 years ago and now, this has been done uh, for, for um, Tahina, for example, uh, then you can actually use other criteria and take that into account. The, the idea isn't to use the same criteria on everything. That's not the point. 
uh, use the criteria for which you have the data. That, that's the real point. Um, and the, the, the setting is that um, we can navigate uh, most of the situations within the different criteria that are suggested by IUCN. Okay, thank you. I think I will ask now one of the audience. One. So there is one from Jean Pedro Cordido, and, uh, and he said, congratulations for your work, very interesting. A very basic question here. Uh, um, so was uh, correlated these species at risk with their soil type occurrence? Is this because the, the climate uh, necessity is no? But the soils is a complete diverse environment. Uh, so in Brazil, some species of palms just exist in glacial soils. I think the, so I the think question he, is, you, yeah. is there a correlation between um, threats and he, soil type? And soil type. I think yeah, I don't, I, I don't know because we haven't, I haven't looked into that. Um, Th that would be something that that's interesting. I, I really think the threat is linked to um, to habitat fragmentation under this criteria, yeah. obviously criteria B. Um, the more fragmented uh, and the more humans impact the, their environment, the more threats we're going to have, and that's why these islands, uh, insular areas, come out as having strong threats. Mm -hmm. In contrast to continental situations. If I may make a comment, it's interesting this point of view because we know that deforestation is, is not random. So, for example, if we look at your soil type distribution in, in Hondonia State in Brazil, so the, the, the places that were uh, deforested first were the fertile soils. And uh, so, so uh, if we think about the, the risks and, uh, and the and, and soil type preferences, I think it's a, it's a good place to... But is that, is that, is that really true? Because yeah. in, in rainforests, at least, you have that impression it's really fertile. So you just deforest and then you don't plant anything on it. Is that, that's kind of how I yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in tropical rainforests. It's, I mean, it's forest other... while, while the forest is there. Huh? Just it's actually the, tropical, the, tropical the cycle, rainforest yeah. soils. Yeah. Tropical rainforest soils are very... Uh, Poor in nutrients because they're all in, mm -hmm. in the in the trees. So, but it's possible. Maybe in other uh, other types of ecosystems that, that that would be true. Okay, now we have a question from Cynthia Freitas. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, what do you think of reintroduction? Oh, oh, Thais, where? Ah, sorry. Uh, what do you think of reintroducing those species that are extinct but growing gardens in the wild again? I know that some palms are hard to germinate, but do you have any idea of the specific constraints on propagation? How botanical gardens may help in terms of providing healthy seedling to reforestation? That, that's a really interesting question, and that's kind of what I was hinting towards about the role of botanic gardens, um, especially for palms. And, I'm, I'm not a specialist on, on these types of questions. Um, what I've seen from my readings is that some palms bode well to um, in situ propagation. Uh, Tahina is, an, is a good example and many others. Um, and some aren't, um, like Heophorbi legionicolis. It's just not, um, the, 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 from what I've read, the, the, the experiments to, to, to propagate that at seed level have, have not been successful with, with seedlings dying off pretty, pretty fast. Um, uh, about reintroduction, I think it's, it's important and reintroduction is something that's been occurring um, uh, throughout, uh, throughout conservation landscapes, in particular uh, with, um, with, uh, with, with uh, animals. And again, Patrick Griffin touched upon that point in, in his presentation, so I'd refer, refer you to one of those talks. Um, and um, we've seen that, for example, on, on, in the Mauritius case, it's been it's been successful, um, and I think it's going to be really important that we do that. Um, assisted assisted gene flow is also something important where we try to rescue critically endangered populations with very low genetic diversity, um, plant put in there different types, and it's important, but it also has its own risk. So um, there are a lot of uh, ongoing projects about how assisted gene flow can can help rescue species on the brink of, brink of extinction. And I, and I hope that within the next decade, we're going to have more insight into how useful and potential that will be.
Thank you, Thomas. I think we are running out of time. So I will, I will ask the last question from Lars and you. And then uh, for the ones that didn't have their questions answered, so please go and find Thomas in the, in the lounge. In I'll the be sequence there. Here. Okay. So Lars said, great talk, Thomas. I was wondering that what could be the reason for a rather low number of red list assessments in palm species outside the African Mad Madagascar uh, region? Is it just because the most, most of palms of Madagascar are being red listed assessed, or maybe due to weak tradition on red listing assessment outside of Afrotropics? Or do you see other reasons for this? Uh, also might be a higher uh, propension, propension of higher palm, higher palm species being red listed, assessed overall, of, uh, for example, Madagascan palm, this overestimating the percentage of total endangered palms of the world from the current pre preliminary knowledge. Yeah, th thank you very much, Lars, for your, for your two excellent questions. Um, I really think it's a question of, of dynamics. Um, the Madagascan um, uh, assessments were done uh, through the um, through the PhD of, of, of Mijuro, um, in, in, in collaboration with Q. The, the, I would say the time was right. Uh, there was a palm expert there. The Q team was really active and is active in Madagascar always. Um, so that's why that led. And Madagascar might be a because it's, it's a single country. The um, African one was uh, a continental one, but again, we had, uh, we had the, the manpower, or, or I'd say the woman power rather, to, uh, to undertake this with the presence of Ariane Cosio um, and, and many other collaborators. Uh, many people were, were involved in the assessment. And maybe that was also some kind of low hanging fruit in the sense that we just had 66 species to do, which still took two years to achieve. Um, so when, when we look at other regions, Southeast Asia, the Neotropics, Central America, the, the, the task is, might be a bit, a bit more uh, complicated, uh, involving many more active um, palm researchers, many different countries, um, and uh, we need to find the, the right moment. And so we're, we're in discussions, for example, with the Colombian species, um, uh, Colombian uh, uh, Survival Commission of Plants to see if we can join forces on palms, uh, but even then, communication remains complicated, and uh, we agree, but then we don't see each other, uh, so it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit complicated. Um, and I really think that that that's one of the points is that we need to find the synergy as a group. And this is one of the calls that I had is I can't uh, or or two or three people won't be able to do this. Um, the IUCN and and many other people have contacted me over the years, assessing uh, all the palms of New Caledonia, all the palms of Hawaii. But these are generally embedded in larger projects, and so they they kind of approach us. Um, at certain moments, um, uh, uh, it's more of an opportunistic um, setting. Um, uh, yes, obviously there's a high bias towards Madagascar and African palms, and um, this bias is going to exist until we have everything onto the red list. We have numerous strategies to address this. One of these is to try and do a, a least concern red listing. So we kind of, as, as, I, as I show, we have about 40% um, of palms which are least concerned. So those could be streamlined. It's not really complicated to do the assessment of a, of a widespread species. Uh, maybe gathering all the bibliographic information is a bit complicated, but it's not too hard. Um, the ones that really take a lot of time are the critically in ones, the endangered ones, because you need to look at the threats, you need to assess the threats, um, dig into the literature of the different regions you're looking at. Um, so yeah, I think there is an overestimation, but we just have to wait to 2020, 2030 uh, until we get all of the palms in there and then we won't see this bias anymore, I think. I think with this, thank you, Thomas. We'd like to, to close the section and uh, invite you all to talk with Thomas in, in the lounge. And so if you haven't been there in the right-hand side of your, your hall, there is a link for this and the first half there is a Zoom meeting embedded, so just join there, okay? So okay, thank you enjoy again. your break and uh, and see you at uh, in one hour for the hour. the Q and A Q and A section for for plant animal interactions. And I'll, I'll be hanging bye -bye. around the lounge if anybody wants to talk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Bye. Bye.